Carrie, you want to start? Sure. Hi, everyone. I am Karen Frank. I'm a physical therapist. And this is my husband, Greg Frank. He's an occupational therapist. We're both certified fall prevention specialists and home improvement contractors. We own and operate a company called Back Home Safely, where our mission is to create safe and accessible homes for people who are challenged by mobility issues and concerns. Um, so we want to talk today about homes and keeping them um, safe and accessible as, as you're challenged with ALS. So I am going to share the screen. There we go. Okay, Greg, you want to go? So most people you run into, including ourselves, want to remain living in their own homes as long as they can, no matter what their their physical condition and their function is able, you know, what their function allows them to do. So what we're going to talk to you about today is how to take a house like this where there's stairs to get in. And once you get in the house, all the bathrooms and showers, they're all upstairs, oh, another set of stairs. They have narrow doors. They've got tubs. We all have the same conditions in all of our houses. But these are the houses that we have our goal to live in for the rest of our lives or as much as we possibly can. So all the, the, the functions we're going to talk to you about today are ways to remain living in these homes. And guess what? Each individual has a different goal for how they're going to live in their own home. Some people really want to go upstairs to the bedrooms and the showers. Some people just want to live in the living room. And that, that's okay. And we're going to talk to you about, about addressing the modifications to your home specific to your needs, um, not to everyone else's thoughts of what your needs should be. So when you're considering safety and accessibility needs or solutions for your homes, you want to keep in mind your goals, like Greg said, is your goal to where in the house is important to you. Uh, you want to also obviously um, consider your functional abilities. Now with ALS, obviously that changes through the course of the disease process. So you might want to consider your functional abilities at this time, but keeping in mind functional abilities in the future. Um, and that uh, go, uh, go, goes in relationship with progression of this disease. And then, of course, you have to look at the layout of the house because that's going to obviously play a large part in what the obstacles are in the home that you're trying to, um, that are challenging you. So one thing we keep in mind are transfers. If we could limit the transfers when you get more deeper into the disease process, uh, it's going to keep the the patient safer as well as the caregiver safer. And we really try to take, a, um, we really try to keep in mind the caregiver as well as the patient because we don't want the caregiver to get injured or the patient. Um, if the caregiver gets injured, it's a big problem. So keeping in mind, we wanna maximize safety for all transfers, whether it's transfers from the bed to the wheelchair, in and out of the shower, on and off a toilet, up and down stairs. We want to reduce the effort of the transfer so that you could save energy and not have to be challenged as much during the transfers. And um, as we said, we want to reduce caregiver strain and injury. So sometimes all people really need is a rail to begin with. So if you're having difficulty going up and down stairs, um, you're scared you're going to fall. Because, you know, we're treating the condition of ALS, but you know what? A lot of people have more of a problem with a fall related to that than from the diagnosis itself. So, so basically, sometimes all you really need to start off with is a couple of rails, whether it's two rails, one on one side. Um, sometimes if you're a taller person, you need taller rails or a shorter person needs them a little bit lower. There, there are guidelines created by the, by the American Disabilities Act, and those are great guidelines. But again, it's your house. They should be catered to your needs and your functional level. So obviously, as the disease progresses, you might need a ramp when you're in a, especially when you, if if someone needs to use a wheelchair, the these are typical aluminum modular ramps. These are great because they can be put in very quickly. A lot of home modification companies like us have these ramps in inventory so they can go out quickly. 
These ramps, because they're modular, there are there is no footings. And because there's no footings, usually you don't need to get permits for these ramps. So that's really great because that doesn't, um, doesn't hold up with the permit process with putting them out. These types of ramps usually have a curb on the side of the ramp so the wheelchair cannot go off the edge. They have handrails, which are really great um, for walking if you are ambulating or someone else is walking up and down the ramp. But the only thing with ramps is that people need to remember you need a foot of ramp for every inch of rise. So every step is usually between seven and a half and eight inches typically. So in that case, you need eight feet of ramp for every step. So if you look at this ramp here in this picture, there's this is a ramp for only three steps. It's 24 feet of ramp, and then there's a, a platform to turn on. So you could just imagine how much ramp footage you need for a house that has five steps or six steps. And that's one thing that people don't usually understand at the beginning. They think they can use like a 10 foot um, portable ramp and just place it in front on their steps and think that that's going to work out well, but that'll be much more like a ski slope. They won't be able to walk or ambulate or propel a wheelchair up, up and down those stairs, that, that ramp. So you really have to keep the foot of ramp for every inch of rise. You also have to take into account the landscape in the front of the house, if there's enough, enough landscape for you to put the ramp footage. Also, if there's a decline or incline in, in the landscape, that makes a difference as well. And um, we'll talk about some other things that you could do as well. But the nice thing about ramps is that you can get your a power wheelchair up that ramp really easily, um, you know, versus if you use something else like a stair lift. So some um, people sorry, would, sorry, Greg. Right. So some people would rather just make a sidewalk to make it look like a ramp. So this person didn't have a sidewalk really leading to her door. So we, we poured some concrete in there and you'll see in the next slide, actually, um, what we recommend to do is bring that ramp right to the door. A lot of us have we walk out of our house, we've got a four or six inch step down onto our front porch. But um, maybe if you address it like this for those people who are ambulating, people who are ambulating with a walker, people who are using crutches, people who are using a wheelchair, whatever it is, just we're just people just walking. It's much easier to walk right in with no step up. And this is called a universal design. So no matter who's using it, this is going to be safer to go in and out. This is made out of bluestone. You can make it out of concrete. You can use pavers. Sometimes pavers get a little bit out of adjustment. Could be a little hard on a wheelchair or a walker. Um, but any surface that's going to be level enough and slip resistant and weather resistant uh, can make a very suitable ramp. But it doesn't have to be ugly. It could look very nice like this. A rubber threshold ramps for in front of those doors. They come in one inch, one and a half inch, two inch, four inches. They come in various different sizes. They're beveled on the side, so you can actually come in from the sides without stumbling. Um, they're really good for those, those door thresholds. So a lot of people uh, have stairs like, like they have in the garage here on the right side, where there's only one rail. Um, there's at the top step is like nine or 10 inches, and the rest of the steps are maybe six or seven inches. And you go to therapy, a lot of us go to therapy, and we learn how to do steps on this that we have on the left, and we think this is going to make us independent steps going up and down those steps. But if, if in reality, if your house looks like it does here on the right, it needs to be modified. Those steps need to be all need to be the same size. You need rails on both sides. Uh, and it makes a big difference in how long you'll have the ability to actually walk up and down these steps. So um, again, as as we're looking at all all these home modifications, we're looking at it in terms of different stages of ALS. Um, so again, some of these modifications are good for the beginning part of, of ALS um, when you're recently, when you're diagnosed at the beginning. And then we'll talk about other things as well that might be something you might use later on in the, in, as you're advancing with this stage. So like Karen just mentioned, if you're going to redesign those steps, it might be advantageous to redesign it with a large platform on that side. Just in case later on, you might need a, 
a stair lift or a vertical platform lift. And we'll go through those modifications later. But no matter what, when you first do the modification um, in year one, a decade later, you might need to change something or whatever later on you need to do it. Uh, we'll have the ability to modify it uh, to accommodate everyone's abilities. So the, this is a stair lift. This is a straight stair lift. So straight stair lifts are a great option. Again, most homes in New Jersey, a lot of homes are multi-level where the primary bathroom and bedroom are upstairs. So at least for a portion of time, if, if uh, you can get upstairs, that would be great. So a stair lift can be put in in just a couple hours, about three hours. It, it plugs into a regular outlet but the battery trickle, the, the electrical current trickle charges the battery. So when you're using your stair lift, it's running off a battery, which means if the power goes out, you still have use of your stair lift, which is great. The foot plate, the seat, and the armrest all flip up out of the way when you're not using your stair lift. And when you take the stair lift all the way up to the top of the stairs, you swivel the stair lift so that when you do your sit to stand transfer, your back is facing the stairs, which makes it a lot, a lot um, safer. Also, these types of stair lifts um, can be rented or purchased. So this is a straight stair lift. So any straight stair lifts, again, can be rented or purchased because it's on a straight piece of track. So a lot of times with um, a medical condition like ALS, we might want to put in a straight rental stair lift to begin with. Because at later on, and as the disease advances, it might be more difficult to transfer onto that stair lift. So maybe you'll we'll, um, you'll choose a different solution in the future. So this is a custom curved stair lift. Some people don't have a straight track uh, set of stairs. So this is the optimal solution. It's made specifically for your house. So you cannot rent these kind of stair lifts. Uh, they, they're great because you start at the bottom, you lift up, you raise yourself up and it wraps around the platform and goes all the way to the top of the stairs. But they are quite expensive. And again, that transfer on and off the stair lift might not work out in the future. So it's just something that you should consider when making your decisions. Uh, another you option. Quick. Yeah. Is it better, the volume better now? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, so. Also, um, another option you can do is you can put two straight stair lifts on instead of a custom curved stair lift. This way you can actually rent the stair lifts if you want. Um, you do have to be able to transfer safely from one wheel, one chair to another. You also have to have enough trunk support to be sitting there safely. And if, if um, the disease progresses and trunk support is an, an issue, you can get a five-point harness to be put on these on these stair lifts as well, but again, it's only uh, as if the trunk support gets worse in the future. You just want to make sure you stay safe for that. So very often we're going to talk about today making modifications for your needs, your specific needs, and your specific desires. So it's your life, it's your house, it's your this. You know, you you choose the activities that are important to you. So this particular house, actually, if you could advance one slide, Kara, uh, if, if you go, if you're sitting on that porch, you're overlooking this lake. And a lot of people, they might be very happy to sit on that porch and look at it, that lake. But the person who lived here said, no, I don't like sitting here looking at the lake because everyone's having fun down there. Everyone's in the water, they're on their boats, and I'm sitting up here on my, on my deck. So Kara, if you go backwards one, please. But if you see all those steps to get all the way down, um, there's those rock walls, very jagged steps, and it's a giant distance from the porch all the way down to the ground. So the, the way we solved this here was putting this basically runway, it's not really a ramp, and there's a stair lift. And this person was able to transfer to the stair lift and go down, the, uh, down that, I'll call it a ramp, but it's just a platform really for the stair lift to, to ride on. And then they had a pontoon boat and it was modified to accommodate the height of the dock. And this was this person's goal was to get out on that lake and enjoy it with everybody else. And mission was achieved. So this is a vertical platform lift. 
So this is a great solution for people who have power wheelchairs or regular wheelchairs and are not able to transfer onto a stair lift uh, and get you up to the main level of your house. So what happens is you roll into these the platform. Greg, can you do that anecdotes or whatever it's called? Oh yeah, yeah. Hold on a second. Um, you're gonna roll into the platform. And then the ramp on the bottom flips up to keep you from rolling out. And as after the elevator platform lifts up to the main level, the door, the gate opens up and then you're able to roll right out. I'm sure a lot of you have seen these at restaurants or possibly even have these in your house. Um, they are, it is a significant piece of equipment. Uh, if it's put on blacktop, you need to put cement down so it doesn't sink into the blacktop in the hot weather. Um, but it is a great way to get you up to your main level of the home without having to do any transfers. This is another, another VPL. And this one was actually, he is a veteran. He said we can share his name. This is Mr. Russo. And we'll talk a little bit about funding later, but Mr. Russo had this um, vertical platform lift put in for free because he was a veteran and was able to get it through the VA. So that's something to keep in mind for any veterans out there. So uh, very often the doors in your home are not wide enough for maybe a walker or for a caregiver to help you or a wheelchair. Um, and they can be sometimes widened only a couple of inches by uh, by installing these offset hinges that you see there on the left, uh, that might give you about another inch and a half of space to get through, might be all you need. Or you can take the door off and put this, this barn door hardware on there to allow it to, to come off. And then there's also, you know, you, there's sometimes you might just have to cut a big hole in the wall and widen that doorway so that everyone can get through there nicely. So putting grab bars in people's houses are very important sometimes, something to hold on to, whether for a caregiver helping you or to hold on to it yourself. It's important whoever does install that grab bar to know what's going on behind the sheetrock, to know what's going on behind the tile so they can install it onto something sound or they can use some, soft, use some hardware that's gonna allow them to make a nice strong installation. So if someone actually does grab that, that grab bar, they're not pulling it out of the wall. Again, who's ever installing those grab bars must understand the construction of the home. So what we usually recommend is a short vertical grab bar as you enter a tub or shower, and then a, a long one against the far wall. But it also depends on how the ALS is affecting you. And if you have a lot of weakness on one side, prefer, preferably, not preferably, but on the left side in this, in this example, then that grab bar on that left is not going to do you any good. So a uh, carpenter might straddle the plumbing on the front wall and underneath the shower head and put a grab bar there. Um, there's um, a handheld shower head comes in very handy. There's also tub seats, tub benches. Um, the a lot of times people have sliding glass doors over their tub or in their shower. And there's usually a towel rod on that glass door. And a lot of people end up grabbing that when they have weakness or balance impairments. So you have to be really careful about that. At times, um, the doors can actually be taken off and a shower curtain rod and ring put on. And with that scenario, then there leaves plenty of room for two people to go in and out so that you're, if someone needs to assist another person in and out of that shower. And then the picture on the right is this woman with who showers in her robe. She looks She's so happy. happy. She really <laughs> loves her grab bar. Um, so that grab bar is really cool because it sometimes there's not a wall where you need a grab bar. So this grab bar comes out from the wall, but you can also lift that part that she's holding with her left hand. You could lift it up and rotate it against against the wall. So you, when you're not using it or when someone else is using the shower, it's not in your way. So these are examples of the tub bench on the left. It's worth two feet. And I know a lot of you probably know some of this as already, but two feet go in the tub and two feet go out of the tub with the idea that you don't have to navigate over the wall of the tub. You could sit down on the tub bench when you're on the bathroom, on the bathroom floor 
um, standing on the bathroom floor and then sit down on the tub bench and slide over. And, um, and then the one on the right is just a, a shower seat. So and this is, go ahead. A lot of times this is a standard setup. A lot of people who have a tub, maybe they, you know, maybe they, they don't own the house or they're renting the house or they don't feel like doing modifications. This is a standard setup for people who, who would like to keep their bathtub in place and not remove it. This vertical grab bar as you enter and exit the tub, the long one on the back there to hold on to the tub transfer bench. This for, works for a lot of people to keep it much safer. And in this picture, you could see the knurling on the grab bars here, which is really great for not making it slippery. Um, something really solid to hold on to. So this is called the tub buddy. Again, this is something for, again, for those people who are looking to not renovate their shower, to not um, rip that out, to keep the bathtub in place. Our goal, again, is to reduce the transfers. The more times if you have to lift someone out of bed, get them over to the shower, lower them down into the tub, transfer them to the toilet. These are all things that are going to require more and more transfers and get the caregiver injured or the person who's being bathed injured. So this is a really good way of saving energy and keeping people safe. So that's called the tub buddy. So they have a shower buddy as well for people who have to get in and out of their showers and do not want to then any their rent their, their home. Um, so they're not going to do a, mo a big modification or Maybe they um, they just want it temporarily and don't want to do a whole a whole modification of their bathroom. There's another company called New Products. It also has a similar type of product. This so is just a hand towel shower shower head that we use. So you know this is something that's a bidet that actually goes on top of an existing toilet. It's awesome. Heated seat, heated water, washes you in back, washes you in front. This is great for those people who, one, maybe don't have the range of motion to reach back there, the people who don't have the dexterity to wipe themselves, the people who'd rather wipe themselves instead of having a caregiver do it for them, or someone who's maybe getting frequent urinary tract infections because they're not being cleaned frequently enough or well enough. It's just something to keep you fresh all day. You know, anytime you go to the bathroom, you're completely clean there. Uh, it's just a fantastic for people who don't, you know, who don't even need it. So I have it in my toilet. Love it. We just moved in December, and before the boxes were unboxed, um, Greg had to make sure the bidet was on the Absolutely. toilet. <laughs> so toilets, you know, a standard toilet is about 15 inches high. Nowadays, newer houses where people who replace their toilets use what's called a right height or comfort height or ADA height toilet. Every brand has a different uh, name for their higher toilets. They're about 17 and a half inches to about 18 inches, but now Kohler is even making a high line that's about 21 inches, which is really great. Now, you don't just want to go with the highest toilet out there. You want to go with a toilet that's higher to allow you to get on and off it easily, but you want your feet to be able to touch the ground also. So as far as that's concerned, um, you want to see address the height of, your pay, of, of yourself as well as your ability to get on and off the toilet. A less expensive way to make a toilet higher is actually adding a toilet seat riser. The ones we like are, the, are made by a company called Bemis that actually has a, a very well-made toilet seat that screws down to the toilet right where the toilet seat screws into, so it's nice and strong. It comes with arms or no arms, and you can actually get it with a, a two and a half inch uh, lift, so it makes it higher for you. So this is a toilet seat lift. It's a really great contraption. It's placed right over the toilet. So at least the one on the left is placed right over the toilet. So you don't have to worry about bolting it in. And um, what you do is you press a button and it actually raises you up. So the exertion required to do the transfer from sit to stand and then to transfer over to a wheelchair is a lot less of an exertion that you need to do. It also is uh, offered with a pail so that you can use it bedside as well. These are these are called PT rails. They're actually secured either to the wall or they can come with a post as well that will go to them and secure to the floor. They're really great for those toilets where there's no wall on either side. People who have a nice elongated large toilet like this would rather use a toilet than use their a commode on top of it because the commode only offers a small hole there. 
uh, and it's, it's offset so that you can actually not pinch your uh, your wrist as you stand up. And this person actually was able to flip the um, the shower curtain over and hold on to it as she came in and out of the shower as well. Oh, watch that again. Second, watch it because you like those so much. I love it so much. So a lot of people, you know, they live in let let's say a, a fifty five and over community. You buy it, you say I'm going to buy a place that that is completely accessible. I don't have to do anything to modify it. And then they realize that there's these two steps to come in on the side. So very often we'll put uh, something like that. A uh, that PT rail can go right in that for one or two steps. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to get in there without coming up with some extravagant handrail. She's still so happy. Friend. She's always smiling. We have to name her one of these days. That's Mary. So accessible showers. Accessible showers is a great idea for someone who has significant mobility challenges. Again, if you can reduce the transfers, like transferring them, a person in and out of the shower by just instead just by rolling someone in a rolling shower chair, it makes it a lot easier. I wouldn't recommend doing a whole bathroom, accessible bathroom shower for someone who has ALS in on the upper levels of a house unless they're installing an elevator because it will be a big challenge to get up those stairs. But if you have a bathroom on your lower level, on your main level of the house, and um, it can be modified, it's a great idea. Um, when you can tr transfer onto, and we'll talk about transferring from the bed to a shower chair later, but if you can transfer onto that rolling shower chair, then you could be rolled into the shower, rolled under a sink, rolled over a toilet, and it just works out really well. We usually use small tiles when doing a shower renovation because for the floor of the shower, because the more, the smaller the tile, the more grout you have, the less slippery it's going to be. Also, when you're doing a shower renovation, keep in mind something called the coefficient of friction. What that is, is it's how slippery your tile is. So something like marble will have a very low coefficient of friction and something that's more textured will have a higher coefficient of friction. So you want to take a look at that. Um, so this, again, this this was for a boy with muscular dystrophy, the shower. So there weren't grab bars. This um, boy couldn't stand up in the shower. But if, if we would normally do grab bars in a shower for someone who can still stand up and a handheld shower head, roll under sink and toilet. And then this, if you go back one slide, um, there's a lot of different brands of shower chairs out there. Uh, so this particular one is a Riften. There's another brand uh, called Raz Design. These are both very high-end chairs that give the ability to very, be very minimal um, when you get them. And they have a lot of opportunity to add on headrests, lateral supports, five-point harnesses, tilt and space features. All these are designed to adapt as people need different uh, specifications added to their chair. And that's one thing also when you're designing a bathroom, if you are doing a bathroom renovation, if uh, a tilt in space wheelchair will be needed in the future, you want to keep that in mind also when if you have options of how large to make that shower. So this is another sh accessible shower. Again, barrier free. So you could roll right in with a rolling shower chair. But and if you notice, there's a, on the left, there is a roll under sink, which is great. The only thing with these is you need to make sure you pad out the piping, the plumbing on the, the, the piping on the bottom, because you don't want to roll into it and bang it with your legs. And you also sometimes people have uh, sensory um, issues with their lower extremities, and you don't want to burn your legs either on the hot pipes. So this is called a best bath system. It's, it's a shower unit. It comes with three walls and a textured floor. It looks like tile, but it's actually not tile. It's actually, um, and what's great about this product is it comes with wood inside. So, um, so that, that what it is, is it's wood wrapped in fiberglass with a gel coat on top of it. And because there's wood all over there inside, we can put grab bars wherever we want. Whereas if you went to Lowe's and Home Depot and got those shower units, there's usually a big space in the wall between the studs and the wall of the shower. 
So this makes it much better to put grab bars in. It also comes with a pull out, pull out bench, a handheld shower head, and you're all set. And it also, because there's no grout involved, it could go in in just a day or two. This is again, this is before and after. This is what the, the tub looked like beforehand. And within two days, uh, there was a completely functional shower there. One thing to note also, when you use a roll-in shower like this or walk-in shower, that space in the shower is used as functional space. So if someone needed help to get on and off that toilet at a time when the shower wasn't all wet, that caregiver could actually stand in the shower to use to help as well. It makes your whole bathroom bigger. It's a really good point, Greg. I never you thought see, about once it. Once in a while, not that often I come up with a good point. Um, mm -hmm. Shower bay. This is something, again, for those people who don't feel like putting the, the, the construction into their home. They want to leave the structure of the home the way they is, the way, they, way it is, uh, and they don't want to um, uh, change anything. So this is something that could be rented or purchased. It's a shower uh, that can go in your bedroom, in your living room, anywhere within 35 feet of a water source. It's got two hoses. You can see on the left there, one hose goes to a sink that, and it, it has a quick, quick disconnect. So the water supplied by the sink comes all the way to the shower. Person wheels in there in their shower, in their shower chair, and is able to either shower themselves or receive a shower by somebody else. And then it's, it, all the water goes into a, a, like a little gully there, or a ditch that has a pump in it. And it'll pump all that, that soapy water back to that sink for the drain. And, you know, some people can get, can get a bed bath and a bed bath is very functional for keeping you clean, but some people feel a lot better if they can take a shower. So there's this shower bay is one of them. That's the one that we really like to use. Unfortunately, it doesn't accommodate a large wheel, a large shower chair or a tilt and space shower chair. So in that case, there is another type of, of shower uh, called a faucet, F-A-W-S-I-T. The faucet shower is something that can be bought in a large format that handles those larger chairs. So this is another device that can help with um, getting in and out of the shower. So again, this is just another way of making a, a, a shower accessible for people without uh, doing the construction. These are um, th these type of grab bars are really good for people who might not have grass. Uh, this particular lady, she was cleaned by her aide next to the toilet while she was standing. She didn't, she didn't have the ability to grasp a grab bar, so she took her elbow and she elbowed around there and she was able to hold herself up like that. So there's a lot of different options out there for people and it's just important to work with your therapist and figure out what are your abilities and take those abilities and figure out how to use those abilities to keep yourself um, as functional as we possibly can and get the equipment out there that's gonna enhance your ability to remain living in your, in your home uh, and taking care of all of your needs. These are called, these, these are called, um, there's, we call them super poles, uh, security poles, anywhere there's no place that a grab bar can be installed to a wall, like by a bed or a couch or a toilet. Uh, they're really good for giving you something to hold on to. Uh, they, they hold on by tension, even though we can sneak a couple of screws in there also, um, and they make it a really a, a safer place to live. Remember, some people, it's the fall that actually prevents them from living there, not their disease process, and this can really help that a lot. This is Brilliant. another version of the Super Pole. This one is um, by the same company. This one is by Stander. And this one will be able to be waterproof. So you could actually use it in showers if you want. Home is your safe place. And now you can have support. I don't think those guys really need that anyway, but. So this is a called a lift chair recliner. Um, some of you may have one of these. This is a really great tool. It's a place that you can sit during the day and be more functional with your sitting to standing. 
it you press the button and it helps raise you up so the exertion to go from sitting to standing isn't very um you don't need as much exertion but it also gives you the opportunity to have a nice comfortable chair where you can recline the things to remember with these lift chair recliners is it's much preferable to get ones with two or more motors because when you do that, then the back is moving separately from the legs. So if you wanna be sitting up and watching TV with your legs up, you can, or if you wanna lie all the way back, you can. There's lots of different options. There's different fabrics, different sizes. Um, and the new, some of the newer versions actually come with four motors. So it, it, it works for the back, the legs, and then they usually have a headrest control and a lumbar control. So this is something that you might want to consider. It's a it it also gives someone a place for someone to usually nap if they want during the day as well. I'll, go ahead, Greg. So there's, there's, there's a lot of these companies are coming out with all different types of equipment uh, to help people get in and out of their, their own chairs and their own couches. We often encourage to go in there and people to get a nice chair with arms on both sides and is a little bit higher to make it easier for the caregiver and them. But when we go to their houses, we realize that they're just sitting back in the couch that they want to sit in, that they've been sitting in for the past 20 years. So we're able to accommodate that furniture as well with, with use of equipment like this. There's a company called Stander and they have a lot of different types of equipment for you. So a lot of times people need two rails and most of our houses only have one rail on the inside of their house. So very often you'll need to get another uh, rail on the other side, whether you need two rails at the same time or maybe only one side of your body is functioning well. So you need one rail on one side on the way up and you need it on the other way on the way down. So it's very simple to get a rail put in there. Uh, the thing to, to pay attention to is the rail should be the same height. The left one should be the same height as the one on the right, or else it throws your whole body off center. The rails should be able to be graspable, that you can get your hand around the rail. So if it's something that's too thick to get your hand around, it might not be as safe. And if you're gonna make it custom, you should make it where it passes the bottom step and passes the top step. So you're not leaning over the stairs, you're not ditching them too early. Uh, and they should look like all the other rails in the house if possible to keep the house looking a very, very home-like and not something where there's too much equipment that doesn't match. Oh, also, um, Ben had frozen at the beginning. I just want to let you know that we will be addressing all the questions at the end of the program. Right. I didn't want you to think we're ignoring you. Um, okay, we'll talk about beds now for a couple minutes. So there's a lot of things to keep in mind with beds. So this is called, a, a lot of people need the features of a hospital bed. So they need the head of the bed to go up and down. They need the, the, the legs to go up and down and they need the whole bed to physically go up and down. Um, because first of all, it's easier to care give from a higher surface. So if you could get a bed that raises up so a caregiver can assist you, it's much better for the caregiver if it's at a higher surface. Also, it's easier to go from sitting to standing from a higher surface as well. So if you're capable of going from sitting to standing, it's gonna be a lot easier on, on a bed that is high-low. This manufacturer called Flexibed is awesome because they do make these beds in many sizes. So it comes in twin, full, queen. The king is just two twins next to each other. But what's nice is some spouses still wanna sleep together but one might need the, the features of a hospital bed. So this serves that purpose. The manufacturer also makes bed rails that can be put on these beds as well. Um, and the best part is it comes with an inner spring mattress, which is very comfortable. And it's something that people you know, want a very comfortable bed. So we, we have this bed in our showroom and um, it's, it's a lot of people really like it. The only thing to consider though, is when you're choosing a bed, there might be a, a time where you're spending a lot of time in bed and you're maybe will have difficulty rolling and getting pressure off your, off your bony protuberances. So in those situations or as the disease progresses, you might wanna keep some other things in mind. Um, I do wanna show you this bed as well. This one's really cool. Um, and this one actually just came out with a newer mattress that does have, is an airflow mattress. 
But this one is really cool because you don't have to pick your legs up and to get them onto the bed. But um, it, it's, it's a newer bed that we became aware of. It is quite expensive though. So the bed that we use a lot with our ALS patients is a bed by a company called Span America. It's their Span America Advantage bed. If the bed is on the left, the nice thing is it does come typically in a 35 inch to 36 inch bed, which is traditionally a hospital bed size. It's a little smaller than a typical twin bed, but it can be expanded to 42 inches, which is nice if somebody wants that kind of bed. When you do go wider in a bed though, know that it's a little more difficult for a caregiver to go over a wider area when rolling a patient or changing sheets or, or whatever needs to be done. Um, the nice thing about this bed is they make a gel mattress for the bed. So if you want a regular gel mattress, you have that. But they also have this APM2 mattress, which is shown on the right. What this is, it has four air chambers in it, and it alternates the pressure from two chambers to another two chambers. It also has a lot of features, like if you're gonna roll a patient on this bed, you might wanna put on auto firm so it all blows up and it's really stiffer so that it's easier to roll someone on. And then after you roll them and get them into a position, then you would put it back on where it's alternating pressures. But it's a really great type of bed to get for someone with ALS. So there's a lot of different types of adaptive equipment for people who might have like, problems with their dexterity, problems with their range of motion, problems with their strength. So you can use built up handles. Uh, these are all readily available on Amazon or various other suppliers of durable medical equipment. Uh, you can even make your own by buying the foam to stick on there. And you could work with an occupational therapist um, with these types of devices to assist with eating. Right. So this is called the universal cuff for people who might have shoulder and elbow motion, but don't have grasp. That universal cuff will hold just about anything you want to stick into it as a utensil. Uh, this, this is called Dyson, which is a material that you lie down underneath a plate or a bowl or anything that you're using that prevents it from sliding off the table. Or a lot of people use a, a bedside table or um, an overbed table. That Dyson will lie down on it and prevent things from sliding over. Or suction cup plates and bowls. Uh, scoop dishes and food bumpers are all things that help people if they want to remain as independent as they can without um, knocking the food off the plate once their dexterity decreases. These are all things that can be very helpful. And again, as Karen said, OTs are usually the person who are going to work with you to figure out which of these will help you the most. So gate belts. Gate belts is a really great contraption. Uh, I, if you've ever worked with a therapist, uh, PT uh, and walking or stair training, a lot of times they use them. But as the disease progresses and you become less steady, um, it really makes things a lot safer. And it's such an easy piece of equipment to, to put on and it's very inexpensive. So it's really great to um, keep calm and put a gate belt on. Mm -hmm. Uh, doorknobs, key grips. Again, this goes along with the with you know going over with your OT. The different gadgets out there, they're endless and they're all available, readily available on Amazon and every other rehab catalog uh, to help you remain as independent as you can be, um, as long as you can be. High tech door management. You know we've all seen these buttons on commercial buildings. Well, guess what? You can get one for your home as well. Some of them even have controls. So if you're in a power wheelchair, you can do it from your power wheelchair. It can actually be incorporated in the joystick controls of that. Uh, it just helps people get in and out of their house uh, with less help from others. Driving, you know, as far as uh, driving schools, you know, I know through Kessler, uh, JFK, there's various different programs where they actually get you behind the wheel and they can, if there is a modification to it, they can help train you on the spinner knobs, the hand controls, um, the left foot accelerators, whatever they might uh, recommend for you. They test you on your ability to self safely use it and bring you to the DMV to get special licenses to say that you can do it. Um, and there's other ways of getting in and out of the car, repositioning yourself in the car. Um, there's lots of modifications. The, the thing in the second from the left is called a handy bar. It's kind of a cool contraption. 
every car has this little um what's that called greg uh bracket or something a loop um, a door latch door latch on it and Good it's word. just this little i think it's like 40 bucks on amazon and you just put this little bar in there and it just gives you something really solid to hold on to when you're getting in and out of your car but might have weakness um it's not very safe to hold on to a wobbly door so instead now you're holding on to something much more secure and gives you something to really push off of and the thing on the right is by a company called Bruno Independent Living Aids, and it's their valet signature seating. And what it does is it actually, the seat come, rotates and comes out of the car. So you could just sit right down onto it and then it lifts up and goes back into the car, which is really cool. But at, for someone with ALS, a uh, wheelchair accessible van is really the optimal thing to get because if you're going to end up possibly having difficulty transferring on uh, um, on and off your wheelchair, if you have a van that just accepts uh, is accommodated for a wheelchair, that's really the best solution because then you could just roll in and roll out. Um, I have heard also that lately it's easier if you are traveling someplace to actually rent an accessible van. Actually, our daughter it volunteers for this um, organization and she's flying out to LA in a couple weeks and she's gonna be, um, she has to rent an accessible van for some of the people coming to the program. So, um, and she had no problem finding one. And then um, on the right is a scooter lift, which gets put onto a regular hitch on your, on your car. So a lot of times Hoyer Lift is what's covered by Medicare and various other insurances, um, which is really great for those people who can't get from their wheelchair um, to their bed and vice versa. However, it's very difficult for a single caregiver in a small house with a shaggy carpet um, to use these Hoyer Lifts. Uh, so they are limited in their function. They do make really great slings these days, though. The old fashioned slings when you were transferred, you just sit on the sling and would call it pre cause pressure ulcers, where now they actually have slings called hygiene slings, which allow you to remove the sling after you've made that transfer. Um, but the better alternative is called a ceiling lift, something that can be installed, either installed up in the ceiling, or it can be actually a portable one. I know one of the questions we're about to answer is, what do you do if you're in an apartment or you don't own the house? This is something that's portable. It's got two posts, a post on either side of the bed that still accommodate that ceiling lift uh, and make it possible for a, one caregiver to do with one finger. It makes it very easy to do. Um, also, if anybody ever gets to a point where they need a Hoyer lift, I don't know if you mentioned, Greg, um, is a lot of times through insurance, a manual Hoyer lift is covered. But what you can do is you can tell the DME company that's that's giving you the Hoyer lift that you want to upgrade to an electrical unit. Um, you could do that with with um, host, regular hospital beds too. Um, and this way, this way you you would have to pay a little extra for that upgrade. But it is a huge difference having an a, a powered Hoyer lift versus the manual one. So um, funding sources, let's talk about funding sources for a minute. Um, Greg, did you want to mention something? About no, that? I just want to tell you, don't get me started on the fact that insurance companies rarely pay for anything we're talking about now. Um, I know Medicare doesn't pay for most of the uh, of, of what we're going to talk about today. Neither do major medical insurance companies. But uh, I think our belief as therapists is to just is to go out there and give everyone all their options to tell them all the things they need to know to keep their homes safe and keep them living their homes as long as possible and not let the insurance companies dictate to them whether they can remain living in their homes or not. So with that being said, there are some funding sources. Medicaid really understands home modifications. So um, under the MLTSS programs, I know we work with Aetna and Horizon, um, but if you are on Medicaid, definitely speak with your case manager about 
um, any concerns you have for safety and accessibility. And a lot of times they'll send out a couple vendors and then they'll pick one and they'll pay 100% for the modifications. They'll also do um, whole bathroom, um, accessible bathrooms as well. Mm -hmm. um, Long-term care insurance, if you do have that, especially those older policies, they are usually robust with their home modification um, support. So you might wanna look into that. Um, don't worry about the TBI fund. Um, or the catastrophic fund, but the VA we spoke about before, the VA is awesome to their veterans who have provided service during certain service periods in New Jersey, not provide in, in New Jersey, but um, in, in for the New Jersey VA. But um, so definitely go through the VA if you need any home modifications and um, get in the system if you are a veteran sooner than later. Um, as Greg said, a lot of people pay privately for home modifications, but it's it's if it's a way that you can remain living in your home, usually it's a lot cheaper than moving. And um, some people go as far as a GoFundMe page. Um, I also wanted to say, and this is our last slide, um, with the we just became aware of this uh, this organization last week. It's called Live um, Hope. Um, help hope live help hope live i'm sorry and um if you go on to um help hope live dot org they have so many resources um some of them are are specific to certain states and some of them are specific to certain diseases and some are specific to children but there's so many different um foundations out there to help people and this specific organization helps with getting you to help fundraise for yourself. So they actually help support that and they give you ideas. And um, again, we just learned about it, but it seemed like an awesome um, program. Um, oh, okay, yeah, that, that's an important slide to have. I know a number of people <laughs> have that. And then we do have some questions that I wanna approach with you. Uh, so sure. leave that slide up. Um, so thank you so much for your presentation, wide ranging from big items like a vertical platform lift and ramp to small items like a universal cuff. It's really important for everyone to be aware of the range of um, items and modifications that are out there. So let me get right to some of the questions that came up. A lot of the items that you made reference to were related to uh, homes, uh, but there were a couple of questions related to apartments or a condo or a co-op. Is there anything that stands out that might be related to a apartment, you know, a smaller space? Yeah, so I think that's where the, the tub buddy and shower buddy come in, uh, the shower bay, uh, the different, uh, instead of replacing a toilet, doing a, an elevated toilet seat, um, the hospital beds can all be put in there, the ceiling lift, instead of installing one in the ceiling, since you don't own it, doing the posts on either side of the bed, um, they all have place um, in uh, condos and apartment buildings, absolutely. And, and you know, to, to that point, um, Karen, you went over a number of funding options. Uh, would insurance cover the uh, stanchion patient lift? I know that they cover uh, the rolling uh, patient lifts that people typically have. but the Right, so they'll cover, so the standard Medicare reimbursement is that they'll pay for a Hoyer lift if you meet certain standards, but that's all they'll really pay for. Now, that being said, there's a lot of very smart people out there who can talk to the right people and get things presented in the right way, and they'll get it paid for. So who are we to say that your insurance company isn't going to pay for it? I believe that they should pay for it. At yeah. least at least come to the plate and take a swing. I, I, yeah. It doesn't hurt. But, it, but unfortunately, but, in our experience, most most of the time they do not cover those. those now, now you could probably speak to this more than we can, but we do know in our local ALS chapter, they have a closet full of stuff, full of lifts and wheelchairs and I all kinds of stuff. I think Ben knows a little bit about that closet. So you could speak to that more than I can. I've, I've heard of that. I've heard okay, of that. Okay, good. <laughs> thanks thanks uh, for the plug. Okay. Um, a number of people, so a number of comments, uh, uh, very appreciative of the presentation. A couple of comments were specifically related to the territory that you cover. Somebody asked if you go to Westchester. No, uh, we don't. Where do you, what do you cover? Yeah, so, so um, 
we unfortunately only stay in New Jersey or which I don't think this um, this group is. We also have a franchise in Charlotte, North Carolina. But um, unfortunately, we cannot cross over into New York. There is um, an organization called Live at Home. Um, it's not a therapist own home modification companies, but I think it's Live at Home. It's through an organization called BGM, like Victor, Greg, Mary. Uh, and um, you can kind of put in your, low, your zip code and you can locate a provider for typical ramps and stair lifts um, and uh, probably accessible bathrooms as well. Um, but these are all people who do home modifications. Um, whoops, just so you know how we work, we um, cover New Jersey from Ocean County uh, across to like Camden County, all the way up north to Bergen and Sussex County. Um, so we do cover most of the state. We will come out to your home for any safety or accessibility needs. And we have therapists or certified aging in place specialists who come out and they do the recommendations. There's no obligation to move forward with anything. And if you do wanna move forward with any of the projects, we have two warehouses in the state where we keep a huge inventory of a lot of products we sell and rent. And um, we have technicians and carpenters on our staff and that's all they do all day is home modifications for people with mobility challenges. So um, feel free to reach out if you do have any questions. Um, the phone number is there. It's backhomesafely.com is the website, um, or you can email us at care at backhomesafely.com um, with any questions, concerns, or if you want a free, a free um, home assessment by a therapist or certified aging in place specialist. Yeah, no, I encourage anybody watching to reach out uh, to Greg and Karen uh, as a resource Related to funding, I'll just point out that uh, there are care services team through our uh, Greater New York chapter that cover New Jersey and Lower Hudson Valley and Long Island and New York City, and they uh, will be aware of other funding options as well. I have one other question that uh, came up, and that is, can you place an alternating pressure mattress like you pointed out on the flexibed? that you we we point. we don't typically do that and it's it, it the size is off um they're both 80 inches long but the size of the flexi bed um starts at about 38 inches which is the size of a twin mattress and for the width and the size of the span america bed is like 35 and a half inches and um, or 42 inches. So the sizes are off. Um, I really wouldn't, I, I don't think I would do it that way um, because it's just gonna be off. So you're gonna have part of a bed frame without a mattress on it, or it's gonna stick over the mattress, over the bed frame. Okay. All Good right. question though. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much for the broad perspective on this whole range of accessibility and keeping one's self safe in their accessible home. Thank you again. Are there any other questions that anybody has? Please type them in now. Otherwise, I'll just mention that the next uh, session is at 2 p.m. It's a breakout session covering estate planning for either New York or New Jersey. You choose which uh, state you want uh, to participate in, and that begins at 2 p.m. Oh, I Thank have one you. other thing, Ben. Um, yeah. Also, if anybody wants to just see any of these items, we have a showroom in Randolph, New Jersey, that has a, both the beds we talked about, not the MedMiser, but the other two, and it has different stair lifts and lift chair recliner. So if anybody wants to come, um, call us and set up an appointment, and we'd be happy to show you the accessibility um, products. Yes, I, I had the fortune of, of going there, and it's a terrific opportunity to see some of these products in a real setting, uh, and the, the staff was terrific, and uh, I think anybody would learn a lot by, by going. Thank by going you, Ben. There. I think there's another question about peened versus knurled grab bars. We usually recommend the knurled grab bars as they have more texture than the peened, but the peened are, are, are also very good, better than a high polish on them. 
There you go. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, too. Bye. Thanks Bye. for attending. Have a good day.